I'd like to welcome each and every one of you to this second lecture in the summer lecture series entitled Truth in Tradition, which is sponsored by the Graduate Program in Theology at the University of St. Thomas. And my name is Andrew Hayes. I am an associate professor uh, in the program, and I also have the honor of serving as the Dean of the Division of Liberal Studies to which the Theology Department belongs. Um, I'd like us to begin this evening with uh, uh, a usual, uh, uh, with a prayer as we usually do, and I'm going to uh, invoke the Holy Spirit on our endeavors this evening. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Heavenly King, consoler, the spirit of truth, present in all places and filling all things, the treasury of blessings and the giver of life, come and dwell in us, cleanse us of all stain and save our souls, O good one. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Well, it brings me uh, great joy to introduce tonight's distinguished speaker, Dr. John Kerwin. He is an assistant professor in theology at the University of St. Thomas and serves as the founding director of our online and in-person graduate program in theology. He's a specialist in modern historical theology, particularly French Catholic thought of the 20th century. He holds a doctorate from the University of Oxford, as well as master's degrees, both in theology and in education. And among his many publications, I would like to highlight two books, An Avant-Garde Theological Generation, The Nouvelle Theologie and the French Crisis of Modernity, published to critical acclaim in 2018 by Oxford University Press, and uh, a book just now forthcoming entitled A Dialogue Delayed, The Thomists and the Nouvelle Theologie on the Truth of Theology and Dogma from the Catholic University of America Press. And he comes to uh, theology also with a, from a seasoned background as an educator, having worked in such diverse places as Tijuana and East Africa. The theology department at the University of St. Thomas is the beneficiary of his considerable erudition and many talents. And tonight um, you will have the chance to partake in some of those riches in this lecture, which is entitled Tradition in the Trenches, Fides et Ratio and the Challenge of Modernity. Please welcome Dr. John Kerwin. John. Dr. Hayes, thank you so much for that uh, warm introduction, and it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, you'll see me usually at the beginning of these talks as uh, I am the director of these talks, and so I'll be doing the emceeing, but thank you, Dr. Hayes, for uh, stepping in tonight. And of course, uh, we'll have Dr. Hayes towards the end of the series um, as he talks on uh, East, uh, one, one of his favorite uh, particular Eastern fathers. Okay, so as uh, Dr. Hayes says, the title of my talk is uh, Tradition in the Trenches. And what I'd like to do tonight is explore um, one of the most important but, uh, and, and most timely encyclicals of the modern era. Um, I don't think we can, we can talk about it enough. It's, although it's almost 25 years old, it was prophetic. When it, when it was first published and equally so today. The title of the encyclical is St. John Paul II's uh, Fides et Ratio on the relationship between faith and uh, reason. And of course, um, this was published in 1998. And what is central for John Paul's thinking in this encyclical? John Paul is quite concerned about the, the relationship between faith and reason. He thinks it's being compromised and particularly so by the, de the degradation of reason. Reason itself has been compromised. So what does that mean? That means that we have a crisis of truth. And so for John Paul, this crisis of truth means, broadly speaking, is that modern, the, the modern human person has been ripped from the truth and is at the mercy of caprice. The, the, even the very notion of the human person ends up being judged by primatic criteria based essentially upon experimental data. What does that mean? Even the notion of the human person, what does it mean to be human? 
is blowing in the wind. It's back and it's forth and it, it fluctuates and changes according to whatever theoretical, theoretical model is current today. So reason then, rather than voicing the human orientation to truth, as he says, it's wilted under the weight of so much knowledge and little by little it's lost its capacity to lift its gaze to the heights. So reason and truth uh, the intellect doesn't even dare to rise to, to the truth of being anymore. So what, what's the result of this? Well, the result is the abandoning of the investigation of being itself, of, of reality, of what's beyond simply the fluctuating material uh, experience. Um, rather than make use of the human capacity to know truth, modern philosophy has preferred to accentuate the ways in which this capacity is limited and conditioned, right? This is all we hear about is the bracketing of the human intellect rather than the flourishing and the fullness of the human intellect. So we end up with these common notions that all positions are equally valid, right? Your truth is your truth. My truth is my truth. There's this widespread distrust of the human capacity for knowledge. And all of this is cloaked, as John Paul says, in this false modesty, right? The, 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 there's a false modesty that says, well, the mind just simply can't know everything. And so we really need to limit it to what we can know. But beyond that, though, there is this scientific hubris that then encroaches on faith and and puts itself in a position to pronounce on a whole range of subjects uh, to which it's ill-fitted. So uh, John Paul calls us back and says, you know, philosophy then, true philosophy, has to be the, the center of thought and culture. And there's obviously there's more implications that we're going to get into. But then there's five major tendencies that he identifies in this um, in this, uh, in this modern milieu. So uh, the first one is eclecticism. And eclecticism is this very common notion that um, basically you can kind of slap together whatever kind of philosophical model best suits you, right? So eclecticism is where, you know, uh, we use individual ideas drawn from various philosophies and there's little to no concern for any internal coherence. Um, there's, there's no sense of, of a system or, a, a, or a historical context for these various ideas. And so basically then we're unable, as we, as we examine a particular doctrine or a particular idea, it's very difficult to disentangle what the threads of truth from the threads of error. And I mean, you can, if you want to see this on this, on a base primordial level, you know, you can often work with uh, high school students or something. And, and they're all, you know, kind of, well, you know, yes, my truth is my truth. You can't tell me what to do. But then when something, when somebody steals their iPhone or something, well, then they flip and then, well, you can't do that. This is objectively wrong for all people in all places. You know, this is, you know, you can't drag my name th through the mud on social media. You know, I'm going to put my foot down. You just can't do that. That's wrong. But wait a second, you know, a minute ago, there was something else. And now, so there's all kinds of eclecticism that John Paul sees. And there's, all, you know, there's, uh, we, we can name many, many examples in, in the sphere of modern theology or modern philosophy where uh, various uh, patches are sewn together in an attempt to create a whole. The second, the second error, eclecticism, the second error is scientism. And scientism is, now we need to distinguish, scientism is not science. Right. Science, we think of of um, gathering data. We think of experimentation. We think of uh, developing hypotheses, working towards conclusions. And all of these things are good and are necessary for the scientific method. But scientism is uh, presumes to encroach on areas to which it's not ready or able to to pronounce judgments. Right. So it refuses to, re to admit the, the validity of forms of knowledge other than, those, uh, that, other than those of merely the positive sciences. And it relegates religious, theoretical, theological, ethical, and aesthetic knowledge to the realm of mere fantasy, but nonetheless makes pronouncements in the moral realm or makes pronouncements in the metaphysical realm even. The third thing that he, the third issue that he sees, the third dangerous current is historicism. 
and historicism is a particularly uh, is a particular problem, especially within the the realm of theology and philosophy, and of course, historical uh, historicism uh, r- proposes that there are no absolutes and everything can be explained by the historical context from which it developed. This is especially especially pervasive, and we seem to be drowning in historicism. Um, the truth of philosophy even is, is determined on the basis of its appropriateness to a certain period, right? And so basically nothing, no absolutes don't make it out of their particular period, right? So Plato can be explained within the, within the, the milieu of Socrates. Uh, Augustine can be explained within the milieu of early fifth century uh, Roman culture, okay? Gregory of Nyssa, his philosophy can be explained within the milieu of, you know, uh, the Eastern context, the Greek context. And so when, when we think this has been, uh, this has uh, been a particular thorn in the side of, of scripture study, because of course, as Pope Benedict has reaffirmed, uh, the historical critical method has, is very necessary for, um, for modern scripture study, but yet there's been so much that has been historicized about the Bible. And so we spe- we especially think of Trolsch, who was in the working in the 1890s, a very famous liberal Protestant, and he developed these three principles of historicism, which have survived today. Well, the first one is criticism that there's no absolutes that exist outside of history. The second is analogy. Historians, what a historian experiences now, must be applied to the historical milieu to which that's being studied. Right. So if you don't experience the supernatural, then of course you can't project that onto uh, an ancient milieu, the ancient biblical milieu, for, for example. And the, the Egyptian Book of the Dead is going to be judged according to the same marks as the Old Testament. And finally, correlation, that everything is contextual. Everything can be found. Uh, the, the reason for any historical event lies solely within the, the historical explanations. And so what we have there is the idea of God breaking into history becomes uh, inadmissible. Okay. F- uh, the third, the third thing is pragmatism and pragmatism just simply refers to, you know, in making choices, pragmatism precludes theoretical considerations or judgments based on ethical principles. Okay. Pragmatism simply weighs things out and the idea of a natural law or moral absolutes simply don't factor into the equation. And where all this ends up, of course, is the fifth, the, the fifth current is a nihilism, which John Paul says is the denial of all foundations and the negation of all. It's a denial of the humanity and the very identity of the human. So the consequences of this are, uh, you, you can draw those out on your own, but you know, for, for John Paul, obviously, uh, the knowledge of God and through the created order becomes um, inadmissible. God becomes inaccessible. Uh, objective morality becomes inaccessible. The human person essentially becomes trapped and limited within a, a, a particular subjective experience. Theology then becomes merely um, a, a, uh, an essay on um, human experience right? The, the, the religious sentiment or religious experience, because the notion of dogma, the notion of a revelation, God breaking into history and communicating to prophets and apostles becomes simply inadmissible. Or the idea of dogmatic truths, that certain truths then can be extrapolated authoritatively from the scriptures and they're binding for all, ple- for all people in all, in all times, right? They're transhistorical. So these things then uh, fall apart. So the very foundations of the faith are at stake here. Okay. So <clears throat> to wrap this up, then uh, John Paul is sketching a milieu that certainly in the last 23 years is stronger than ever. And um, there's been various attempts at uh, creating uh, illustrations or analogies of this modern this, this modern place that we find ourselves. And I, I think one of the most fruitful is from Father Michael Sherwin. And he compares, <clears throat> he, in, in preaching a, a, a sermon on Fides et Ratio, he compares the modern milieu to the World War I Battle of Passchendaele. And of course, those of you who know a little history know that 
the Battle of Passchendaele was uh, one of the most brutal battles of the entire First World War, one of the most brutal battles ever. And the, the French and the Germans uh, squared off and um, they were in the, 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 the lowland of Flanders, which is up in the north. And um, it was bombed into oblivion for months with heavy artillery. And the, the field in Flanders, Flanders had a very delicate and very sophisticated irrigation system that farmers had developed over generations and generations and generations. And within a few months, it was completely obliterated. And then it was, it was pockmarked with, with shells, with shell holes everywhere. And then the rain set in and flooded everything. And there was no, nothing green was alive. The trees were gone. Uh, there was still, you know, mustard gas going back and forth across the battlefield. It truly was a hellscape. And the, 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 the mud then made it almost impossible to, uh, to travel. And they would put pallets everywhere that they wanted to go. And so what happened was countless soldiers simply fell into the mud and, and were, they were unable to get them out. And they would just sink for days until finally they, they died of, of heat exhaustion or uh, lack of, of water. And, and um, it, it's been remembered for, you know, as, as a particularly brutal battle. And so what Father Sherwin says is, uh, you know, he says that many young people today have been left mired in a viscous mental ooze of bad ideas and confusion. And Fides et Ratio, really, he says, is, is St. John Paul II's uh, recognition of the landscape. And it's him laying out the necessity of employing new tactics. So this is, this is the, a, a brief overview of the, uh, of the, the um, of the encyclical. So, um, what, the, but I, I think we can, we can draw this out and we can say, well, yes, I mean, here we are on Wednesday night, we're gathering together for a theology workshop. You know, okay, I'm not a relativist. I'm not a scientist. I, I'm, I'm not infected by scientism or materialism. I'm not a positivist. I'm not a pragmatist. You know, I'm trying to, you know, uphold truth. And we would certainly be right in saying that. But what I want to propose then is to take it a step further, is to say, and, and I'll stretch out Father, Father Sherwin's uh, analogy of Passchendaele, is that I think there's some, some important and some threatening non-fatal wounds. And I'm going to call these three crises. And so just being in the culture, almost by osmosis, right, we, we simply are damaged. We, we encounter these struggles. And so... And John, the, the first one is this crisis of truth that still affects us, even if we can kind of theoretically uphold this, this notion of truth, right? And the mind's ability to grasp uh, object, objectivity. Nonetheless, um, there is still this tendency to simply withdraw from the fight because the forces arrayed against us and the forces are array, arrayed against this, the possibility of, uh, you know, a full metaphysical range as John Paul says, are just simply too overwhelming. So we just simply withdraw into kind of a fideist bunker. And John Paul too recognizes this in, in uh, Fides et Ratio. And, you know, it, this, this could be, you know, a fideism out of, out, out of fatigue or laziness. So for evangelicals, they're going to they're gonna just fall back on the Bible, right? For Catholics, they're going to fall back on the, the magisterium or the church's teachings. Well, this is what the church says. And when it does speak on a particular topic, we need to listen to it as a true authority. But nonetheless, uh, Catholic intellectual life insists on the relationship between faith and reason, that if the church asserts something, it has to be grounded also in reason. And so uh, John Paul sees abandoning truth is, is also a, a, it's just simply, simply seeding ground. And so we don't want to, we, we, want, we want to be careful not to kind of retreat into a fidea stronghold and just try to weather and ride the thing out. Um, he says there's a resurgence of fideism which fails to recognize the importance of rational knowledge and philosophical discourse for the understanding of faith, indeed for the very possibility of belief in God. The second, the second uh, uh, crisis that I'm going to identify is the crisis of Americanism, and this is a crisis of contemplation. I mean, Americanism was a crisis that was most profoundly felt in France 
over a hundred years ago. And it was a, it was a current that simply espoused the, it simply espoused action over contemplation. And this was a, something that even well-meaning and very faithful Catholics were getting sucked into this notion that, look, we have to counter the culture. We have to defend the principles of the faith. We have to de defend the principles of, of the common good. And so we need to get out there and we need to move. We need to work. We need to build. And there was this emphasis on action over contemplation. And, there was, and so there was this very implicit embrace of modernity and this kind of notion that, that action is what counts. And so what suffers is the intellectual life. There's French historians have done work on this period and they've, they've argued that uh, what that that uh, religious vocations, for example, declined dramatically, and it wasn't be, be because of the concurrent modernist crisis, which would be more akin to the, the five uh, errors that I that uh, that I mentioned earlier, but it, because of the American the American the crisis of Americanism, and there was a th there was a a, 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 a countering by a very well-known Benedictine monk who wrote a famous book called uh, The Soul of the Apostolate. And this book was single-handedly, it went through you know, numerous, numerous printings in France, and it was single-handedly uh, credited with kind of stemming the tide of Americanism with, in France. And so um, what he says is, you know, he, he, here's, here's one quote, and his name is, was, uh, was uh, Dom Chotard from the Abbey of Septfond. He said, he writes, this is how often this is how it is often with the man of active works. When he has to consider the interior life, he disdains or rather he detests it all the more because it is the only remedy to his morbid state. Rather than live a life of prayer, he will do his best to stupefy himself under an ever increasing avalanche of badly managed enterprises and thus to set aside all hope of cure, full steam ahead. And while the helmsman is admiring the rapidity of his progress, God sees that since the pilot does not know his job, the ship is off course and is in danger of being wrecked. What our Lord is looking for above all is adorers in spirit and truth. But these activist, uh, these uh, activist heretics for their part, imagine that they are giving greater glory to God in aiming above all at external results. So it's written in the, in the harsh mode of late 19th century uh, French Catholicism, but certainly we can see that even well-intentioned people, we, we can all, of course, we're far more busier than the people in France circa 1900 were. And so the temptation to uh, avoid contemplation and avoid the intellectual life is, is all the more greater. Thirdly, I'm going to call it a crisis of, of unity. And this is simply the, the product of a, of a, of a hyper-moving, frenetic, a technocracy in which we live. And this is this, this individualism. And we are also aware of this, that this doesn't even need really underscoring, especially now. I mean, you can look at even the, the data of, uh, of, you know, of, of using social media and you know, how this increases senses of isolation and anxiety and depression. And further, uh, you, what was already a strong tendency towards individualism in the 20th century now has even uh, exponentially increased with the digital media. So we have these three crises that, I, I, that I'm arguing are a danger to, either, to, to, to those of us who even are, would align ourselves against those five tendencies, historicism, relativism, pragmatism, scientism that John Paul laid out. And so what's the antidote? Well, the antidote that, that, that is laid out is, you know, we, we need to get back to our true nature. We need to get back to who we really are. John Paul II says that we are, by nature, we are philosophers. We are seekers of truth. And so we need to break out and allow intelligence its full due and to embrace fundamental principles. And so the way he says we should do that is, well, first and foremost, we need to, we need to seek right reason. How, how do we fix the intellect? And he says that the, first, the very first step in this is we need to return to this core philosophical insight which is that there is a body of knowledge, which he calls implicit philosophy. And we all feel that we possess these principles in a general and unreflective way. And they serve as a kind of reference point for different philosophical schools. And so these principles have largely been rejected by modern philosophy since 
um, well, we could trace it back, especially since, since Kant, but we go back further in a more radical way, Hume and, and even you know, further that with Spinoza and Descartes. And so uh, what are these principles of implicit philosophy, these principles of common sense? Well, the principles, first, the principle of non-contradiction, principles of, of finality and causality, the concept of the human person as a free and intelligent subject with the capacity to know God, the, the capacity to know truth, the capacity to know goodness, goodness, the fundamental, the capacity to know the fundamental moral norms, which are shared by all. And so John Paul II is, is picking up on a, on a, on a, on a very important and consistent uh, Thomistic notion that's called common sense. It was, it was laid out in its, in its most influential form by his teacher, Garigou Lagrange. But we can return to Pope Benedict and Pope Benedict in, in, in the personalistic style that he's known for says the same thing without the technical apparatus. He says, man is not trapped in, 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 in a hall of mirrors. Man is now trapped in a hall of mirrors of interpretations. One can and one must seek a breakthrough to what is really true. Man must ask who he really is and what he is to do. He must ask whether there is a God, who, who God is and what the world is. He, he gave that in, in a speech a, a year after Fides et Ratio, particularly it was introducing Fides et Ratio to one particular group on his trip to America that year. And so uh, breaking out of this hall of mirrors to begin to ask these vital questions. And John Paul in the Thomistic style says, look, we need to return to these fundamental principles of, of, uh, of knowing, but both are saying the same thing in their different styles. So, um, you know, one of the important things that, that, both, that both John Paul II and Pope Benedict underscore is, well, we need to return to tradition. Yes, we need to return to this attempt to break through the Hall of Mirrors. We need to reclaim the implicit philosophy, but we need to especially return to tradition because it's in tradition and revisiting the moments, the, the, the great and climactic moments in the, this ongoing discussion about the relationship between faith and reason. It's in returning to those that we revisit some of these very central questions that will help us formulate answers um, for today. And so uh, John Paul draws a very close link between ph philosophy and theology, understanding well that they both essentially safeguard themselves, okay, and they support each other. And so this return to tradition, this is in chapter four of uh, Fides et Ratio, and John Paul says, look, within these moments, we really get a sense of what the real uh, philosophical questions are, and they'll help us then to move forward. Benedict, likewise, underscores the need to reclaim tradition. Um, in his first, in his general audiences, soon after he became Pope, what did he do? He started moving through the church fathers from Pope Clement all the way through the patristic period. And of course, this is now published in three volumes, but basically this is him opening up the tradition for the laity and in doing what he does so well, which is teach in, in, a, in a clear and easy way, profound truths. <clears throat> but Benedict says, tradition is not the transmission of things or words, a collection of dead things. Tradition is the living river that links us to the origins, the living river in which the origins are ever present, the great river that leads us to the gates of eternity. So both popes, St. John Paul II and Pope Emeritus Benedict, they both really underscore this, the necessity of returning to tradition, okay? And so um, what I'm proposing then is, I'm, I wanna circle back then and uh, re revisit these three crises in the trenches that we're experiencing, the crisis of truth, the crisis of contemplation, and the crisis of, of individuality which is kind of, you know, the, the collateral damage from the five great errors that John Paul laid out in Fides et Ratio. Okay, so I'm going to kind of go through these, 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 these three crises, and we're going to look at the tradition and see, well, what does the tradition provide us to ensure that we don't fall uh, to these, what I call these non-fatal wounds of Passchendaele? Well, the first thing is the crisis of truth, okay? In, in the search for tradition, we first encounter the, the, this crisis of truth. And 
we are enjoined by the tradition then to return to our books. The first, the, the first step is simply that we study. We study the fathers, we study the doctors, we study the, myst the mystics, the martyrs, the great theologians, the moderns, the ancients. We have to simply approach anew, like Boethius waiting for his death sentence on the floor of his cell. Lady philosophy enjoins him to return to what is real and to dismiss the muses, dismiss all of the chatter that constantly reminds us of our uh, the, the, the temporal distractions that can, that can get in the way of, of our eternal destiny. And so this reclaiming truth. Now, how do we reclaim this in the trenches? Okay. I mean, how do we do this? Because we're, we're so busy. How do we embark on study? Well, we can only think of, you know, one of the most influential philosophers of the 20th century, Etienne Gilson, a layman. There he was in, in, in some of the the heaviest fire of the, war, of the First World War. He was a French machine gun captain. He was a, a, a Catholic who uh, was already well on his philosophical journey when he was called to the trenches. He had finished, he had just finished his very important lectures on um, the philosophy of St. Thomas Aquinas that were published in 1919. He was just beginning to study for a cycle of lectures on St. Bonaventure. Both of these became famous and, and influential works. And yet he was, um, he, he was a captain in the infantry and he found his life in danger countless times. He was wounded by heavy artillery. He was taken prisoner. And yet all the while he, he took books with him. He was reading St. Bonaventure in the trenches and he even found time to, to pen two articles, which he, had, he somehow he found a way to send back to France and had them published, art, artic, articles on, uh, on aesthetics. And even when he was a POW, he found a way to somehow buy books from, you know, from, from this or that local, book, local bookseller. And so uh, Gilson is a, is a reminder that um, there's always a, a, such a, a necessary impetus for study, especially study of the fathers. He was studying Bonaventure in the trenches. This is uh, highlighted in, in, I think, in the best terms by C.S. Lewis, who, of course, also saw heavy combat in the First World War. And C.S. Lewis was brought to preach a sermon to the students uh, at the outbreak of the Second World War in the Cathedral of St. Mary the Virgin on High Street in Oxford. And C.S. Lewis, he had fought bravely in the Somerset Light, Light Infantry. He wrote poetry. He read during the First World War, all the while in, amidst the confusion and the distraction of trench warfare. And his sermon on learning in a time of war is an absolute classic. And I'll just read you a few lines. He said to the students, he said, if you attempted to suspend your whole intellectual and aesthetic activity in a time of war, you would only succeed in substituting a worse cultural life for a better. You are not, in fact, going to read nothing, either in the church or on the front lines. If you don't read a good book, you'll just simply read bad books. If you don't go on thinking rationally, you will just simply think irrationally. If you reject aesthetic satisfactions, you'll fall into sensual satisfactions. There is, therefore, this analogy between the claims of our religion and the claims of the war. Neither of them, for most of us, will simply cancel or move from the slate, the, the merely human life which we were leading before we entered them, but they will operate in this way for different reasons. The war will fail to absorb our whole attention because it is a finite object and therefore intrinsically unfitted to support the whole attention of a human soul, right? And we could substitute, you know, the, wor the, the war for the modern world, the church and the modern world are constantly vying for our attention, not only spiritual attention, but our intellectual attention. So how do we approach tradition? Well, it just simply means, it doesn't simply mean piling on uh, one on another, uh, the secondary texts of historical theology, which leave us knowing a lot of information, but with knowing very little about the, the actual writings of the masters themselves. So it means returning to Boethius in his cell and reading the Consolation of Philosophy. It, remain, it means reading Gregory of Nazianzus, imploring the Eumonians to exercise humility in their theology and therefore correct their, their fourth century heresies that were creating so many problems. 
It means reading origins on first principles, to read the first attempt at a summa, the first attempt at a gathering together of the collective human, uh, of, the, of the collective theological knowledge of the age in 225 AD. Of course, it means with, with, with Etienne Gilles Son, it means reading, you know, Bonaventure's Journey to, of, the, of the Mind to God, you know, in, in this great synthetic medieval work. And especially in, in, a, in a special place, it means returning to St. Thomas in his masterpiece of organization and synthesis. It means reading the moderns. It means reading Newman on development. It just simply means returning to the tradition and letting the, the, letting the doctors of the church speak to us in our, in our situation. Okay. I mean, uh, this, this, um, how do we read them? Well, we read them as Dei Verbum 12 says, Vatican II, one of, you know, the, an incredibly important uh, section in, in the document on Revelation. We need to read, we need to approach the tradition in light of scripture. Scripture is meditated on, it's articulated, it's thought through within the tradition. It's pronounced on authoritatively in councils. So we have creeds and we have dogma that are virtually revealed, scholastics say. And so we read the scriptures, we read the tradition synthetically, always with an eye to the principles of revelation from which this, revel from which this reflection springs, but always glancing forward towards the final dogmatic formulations, which will take shape as a result of these masterpieces. So the unity of scripture, the living tradition of the church, we read them according to the analogy of faith, which is, you know, this intrinsic relationship between scripture and dogma and the monuments of tradition through which uh, the fathers and, and uh, the medievals are included. So this is this, this, this first crisis is the, the crisis of truth. And so uh, we, the crisis of truth, returning to our books in the trenches. The second then is this crisis of contemplation, right? The, the crisis of contemplation. And so the first demands of the spiritual life, right? Especially in the Thomistic synthesis, the, 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 in the uh, contemplation is a fundamentally intellectual act, right? It, it's uh, uh, contemplation springs from intellectual knowledge, okay? So we think of St. Thomas and th theologians are especially called to contemplation. Theology itself is true wisdom. Wisdom is a knowledge of ultimate causes and principles. And so uh, the, the, the wisdom of theology is concerned with inner harmony and structure of knowledge. John Paul II writes movingly about this in chapter four of Fides et Ratio, because wisdom precisely in this sense has been lost by, by modernity, because wisdom concentrates on the, the, the causes and the origins to better understand the whole. Right. But modernity just simply takes the scalpel to one thing after another. And modernity separates, but never unites. We're just simply left with 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 greater and greater numbers of of disciplines and uh, distinctions. But yet bringing them back together in a spirit of wisdom to understand the whole and to understand the parts simultaneously rarely happens. And so this, this uh, theological wisdom, right? I mean, it, it, it directs the intellect and the affections. So we approach the fathers, we, we return to our books in order to study and re-engage the intellect and to tap into the great river of tradition, right? But yet we don't stop there. And, and, and wisdom in, is, finds its incarnation in contemplation, right? In, uh, contemplation is the instantiation of wisdom the highest act of the intellect. And what is contemplation? It's a single resting gaze, right? It's, it springs from wisdom and it sees the, the unified whole as, as parts. And so theology is wisdom and wisdom act, wisdom's act is contemplation, right? So contemplation, we think of, you know, so uh, contemplation might spring from meditation, but meditation, for example, in the Carmelite sense, is discursive. It moves from A to B. Contemplation isn't, isn't concerned about moving from point A to point B to get to point C. Contemplation simply rests its gaze. And contemplation, of course, is this great antidote to um, th this kind of frenetic division of Americanism that even in the midst of a faithful life, like we're still prioritizing constantly action over contemplation. And contemplation can occur in the scriptures or in the tradition, right? For example, a contemplation is profound when, it, when it's brought to bear on 
uh, on the incarnation by Athanasius, this great reflection on the uh, the the constant the constant the the constant sub excuse me my mouth is is dry the consubstantial nature of the the uh, the Godhead okay so uh, contemplation in the trenches then um, we have uh, we have a great example um, Michael Carlier who was a uh, was a French monk and he was in the in the Abbey of of uh, of Shammai. And he was called, he felt called to the contemplative life from his, from early childhood. And he, he read, he excelled and his life revolved around uh, simply wanting to be one with God. He wanted to be alone. He wanted to, um, to glorify God in his solitude, but yet he came from the tradition of, of, of St. John of the cross and so there was this very Thomistic understanding of contemplation that it was a fundamentally, it was an intellectual activity. So he excelled in trying to know the tradition. He excelled in his studies and he was called, he was called to the trenches. And uh, his, as he left for his abbey, his, his abbot told him, he said, be a good soldier and never forget that sanctity consists in the entire accomplishment of the will of God in one's regard at every moment. Life in the cloister and life on the battlefield are each adequate to make one a saint. And with those words, um, Brother Carlier tried at every moment to, uh, to exemplify the, the religious life within the, the horrors of trench warfare. How do we, he, he, he was killed. Uh, he, he fought heroically for years, saw the heaviest combat and he was eventually killed. And we know about him because he left these, these uh, rich and lengthy journals behind. And so um, there's, there's been some books written about him. And he, at every moment, he, he attempted to make the trench his cell. And all of the noise of bombardment, all of the chaos, the death, the confusion, he was always attempting to, uh, to, to keep a, a contemplative spirit. And um, he says, um, he meditates on the monastic tradition with a view to conform. He's, I meditate on the monastic tradition with a view to conforming my present mode of existence to it. And I endeavor to belong completely to God and to be filled with the thought of him. And so to dispose of myself that the state of my soul may be a continual offering. Lord, my God, behold me ready to accomplish thy will. I am thy servant unreservedly at thy disposal. But his was not a contemplation of, say, Meister Eckhart or centering prayer or this kind of modern mindfulness, this kind of emptying. His was the contemplation of John of the Cross, where it was very much, it was the fruit of intellectual labor. And it was the, the simple gaze of rest, resting on the, on the mysteries. So finally, then, well, this, this third crisis, then the crisis of union. So the crisis of truth, Etienne Gilson in the trenches with, you know, finding time somehow to read Bonaventure. We have uh, Brother Carlier determined to bring the, the monastery and the contemplative gaze into the trenches. <clears throat> and finally, the crisis of union. And of course, this is a crisis of union with, with this. We, we, we talked earlier about this individualism, the crisis of union with God and with others. And that brings us to... My favorite conversion story, uh, uh, certainly of World War I and, and, you know, certainly of the 20th century with uh, the nominal Anglican David Jones, who became a, a famous painter, poet, and sculptor. And uh, David Jones was a private in the, in the Royal Welsh Fusiliers, and he was in the trenches for longer than any other poet or, or writer in, uh, uh, in World War I. He was in the trenches from 1915 to 1918 saw an, an absolutely enormous amount of combat. And he was wounded at the Battle of Somme. Of course, you've, some of you have heard about the Battle of the Somme. And, but yet he had this most remarkable conversion because even though he was only nominally religious, he was sent close to the lines, but just behind the lines to go gather firewood. And of course you can Google pictures of the Battle of the Somme. It wasn't known for the mud of Passchendaele, but it was known as, you know, as, as a bleak hellscape where life had been destroyed and all that remained were these mangled trees and things. I, we, we remember um, 
we remember the Somme, especially for uh, the tens of thousands of British soldiers that died in a single day as they were sent wave after wave after wave, charging headlong into machine gun fire. And David Jones, uh, he's gathering firewood and he approaches a small farmhouse and he sees a uh, he, he and he approaches a hole in the, in the in the wall, a, a stone fire, a, a stone farmhouse with a hole in the middle. And he says, "What I saw through the small gap in the wall was not the dim emptiness I had expected, but it was the back of a priest in a gilt-hued planeta. Two points of flickering candlelight, no doubt, lent an extra sense of goldness to the vestments, and a golden warmth seemed, by the same agency." to lend the white altar cloths and the white linen of the celebrant's alb and the amice and the maniple. You can imagine what a great marvel it was for me to see through that chink in the wall and kneeling there in hay beneath the improvised mensa where a few huddled figures in khaki were. And so for David Jones, it was suddenly like, you know, glimpsing from the Battle of the Psalm, glimpsing into another world of spiritual union. He, he continues, he says, I can't re recall at what part of the mass it was that I looked through that squint hole. And I didn't think I ought to stay long as it seemed rather like, as I seemed rather like an uninitiated bloke prying on the mysteries of a cult. But it made a big impression on me. For one thing, I was astonished to see how close to the front line the priest has, had decided to make the oblation. And I was also impressed to see Old Sweet Mulligan, a somewhat fearsome figure, a real pugilistic, hard-drinking Celt, kneeling there in that smoky candlelight. At that mass in Flanders, I felt immediately the oneness between the offerant and those tufts that, cl that clustered round him in the dim-lit fire, a thing I never felt remotely as a Protestant at the office of Holy Communion, in spite of the insistence of Protestant theology on the priesthood of the laity. And so, of course, he's just gazing into this quiet. Of course, this is the, the old low mass. So there's just a, a quiet stillness. He sees the flickering. And it's like for him looking into another world. And he sees for him then, um, he, the men in the barn, these were sacrificial men. Somehow this whole act then became this actualization of the sacrifice on the cross. They were both types of, of, of Christ who would be slaughtered. Yet at the same time, they were heirs of Cain who will kill others. And he goes on and writes later, he says, the mass makes sense of everything. And he goes on and he applies, he, he develops, he, he converts three years later, in, well, three years after the end of the war in 1921. And he, uh, he develops this, this theory of art that he will then apply to um, this, his theology, the mass. And his theology of the art basically is the insistence that a painting must be a thing and not the impression of something that has an affinity with what the church said of the mass. So a painting is not just a, rep a replica, it's an actual thing. And likewise, the mass then takes on this real dimension, this real historical event. Um, and, and what was oblated under the species of bread and wine at the supper was, uh, was the same thing as what was bloodily immolated on Calvary. And so this continuity then, really springs forth and we see some, some real similar overtones in the reflection, in the, the, the substantial reflection of Benedict the 16th, where Benedict talks, um, talks at, at great length about the actualization of the mass in the here and now, and how in the mass, not only are we in touch and especially he highlights for, for extensive reflection in, in a number of different writings, how important the Roman can canon is, what we call the, the first Eucharistic prayer. Right? Because within the Roman canon, it has this chiastic structure where it essentially begins and ends with listing the saints in heaven. Right? So for Benedict, then, it's this real drawing into tradition. But yet the canon also, it, it, it hearkens our sacrifice, which is now this, this reenactment of the sacrifice on the cross. Right? It, 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 it connects it very clearly to the Old Testament sacrifice of Melchizedek and Abraham. And so it's also for Benedict very much a union between the Old Testament and the New Testament. But he goes on further and he'll draw this out, you know, that it's also a principle of unity between ourselves and, and, and the other members of the body of Christ, where we pray for them, we offer them, and also our dearly departed loved ones. So the canon then is this great um, actualization of the sacrifice on the cross.
And so I will, um, the, the, the sacrifice in its essence is simply a returning to love and is therefore a divinization. The essence of worship is this process of assimilization, assimilation of the growth in love. But now it assumes an aspect of healing, right? Which is this ultimate, um, this, this ultimate resolution to the problem of uh, the individualism of our age is, the, is this healing and reconciliation, not only with God at, at the foot of the cross, but also with our brothers and sisters. And so this, he, he brings this all together in, the, in his notion of the cosmic liturgy. Such sacrifice has nothing to do with destruction. It is an act of new creation, the restoration of creation to its true identity. All worship is now a participation in this, in this Passover of Christ, in his passing over from divine to human, from death to life, to the unity of God and man. And so this concludes then this, this, uh, this search for the tradition to overcome this crisis of individualism. Let me just conclude here with a, um, a, a fantastic experience of Brother Carlier that I think brings together this uh, importance of this returning to the tradition to combat these, 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 uh, these wounds of, 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 uh, of re the wound, the, the wound, wounded reason and uh, the wounds of Americanism, this, the, the wounds of contemplation and also the wound of unity. And in this, in this almost incredible experience after a, a, quite a long time in combat, brother uh, Carlier is, uh, he's with his unit and um, at, at, at one point, suddenly he realizes, of course, because he doesn't know where he is. He's somewhere in, in southern Belgium uh, on the border, but some, he, he comes to this hill and suddenly he realizes that he's looking down at the abbey where he had hoped to spend his whole life and to die. All of his aspirations toward the contemplative life were somehow tied up in that abbey, the abbey of Shammai. And he looks and he writes later and he says, there it was. And on the left was the bell tower whose pale steeple recalled many happy memories. And he writes and he lingers there as long as possible. And he tries to find the area in the woods where he would go to chop wood as a young monk. And he concludes and he says, and for a long, long time until we arrived at the summit of the hill, I kept my eyes fixed on the abbey in which I had so confidently hoped to die. And all the more moving is the fact that uh, here is this abbey, of course, which the abbey of Shimei, it represents this, this, this tradition, this Cistercian tradition that's, you know, almost a thousand years old and his own immersion in the tradition and his, his, the actualization of, of, of his intellectual engagements with this kind of single gaze of contemplation. It's all wrapped up suddenly in seeing this abbey to which he couldn't return, but which he but which he, he promised himself at the very beginning that he would always attempt to incarnate in the trenches. And so there he is. And of course, he never makes it back. This place that where he longed to live out his days, he never returns. And his brother is also uh, dies at the front and he spends his, his days uh, in, in, uh, in contemplation in the trenches, offering up sacrifices for his men and for uh and for his family. And it's interesting in, in the witnesses, then they, they, um, the, his fellow soldiers kind of, uh, unanimously held him as a remarkable, remarkable man, a remarkable soldier, always upbeat, never complaining, always running to help, to help others. He had a, a, an engaging and a charismatic personality. He was beloved by all, and they just simply refused to believe it when word came down that he'd fallen. And so there's uh, Brother Carlier kind of reminding us that even in the midst of the turmoil of our own little trenches, as Father Sherwin said, would say, is kind of keep our gaze on tradition, keep our gaze on the abbey of our longing. So thank you very much. Um, this is, um, this I, I've attempted to, to uh, really, uh, structure this talk as uh, Cardinal, Cardinal DiNardo last week in his wonderful lecture on, on Irenaeus, which was fantastic because Irenaeus is the first theologian. And we, we conclude this series uh, 
with John Henry Newman, uh, with Dr. Aquila and on John Henry Newman and the development of doctrine. So it's just, it's a fan, it, it just kind of fell that way, but it's a fantastic evolution kind of from the, from the beginning to the end. And, and the Cardinal said he, he was hoping to, uh, to provide some hors d'oeuvres. So what I've uh, attempted to do is to provide maybe the menu is this, this structure of, of this lecture series, Truth and Tradition. This is what we do at University of St. Thomas. This is what we're passionate about, is, is taking students deep in the tradition and not in the secondary and the scholarly way, but leading them into the great works themselves. And so this attempting to kind of lay out the importance of tradition and how tradition, immersing ourselves in tradition, uh, heals a multitude of wounds. And so I've attempted to kind of get you fired up for the rest of the talks and to kind of provide a, a, a reason for being of the rest of the talks. So I am going to uh, hang around. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Next week, we have a real treat. We have uh, Father Dempsey, who if you know UST, University of St. Thomas, you know Father Dempsey is, a, is quite a, a beloved figure here. And he won uh, the, the, the prestigious Aquinas Award for Teaching Excellence this year. He's a fantastic speaker. And I can't wait to see what he has to say uh, next week. And uh, everything is on our Facebook page, the department's Facebook page. We have all the schedule. We have our U uh, UST Theology is our YouTube page. All the videos will be up, up there. You can access them at any time, in addition to, obviously, Zoom. So I will hang around. And uh, if, you, if you have some questions you've answered in, I have two very, very hardworking and incredibly dedicated uh, grad students who are working behind the scenes to, to kind of keep things running and, and gather uh, questions together and things like that. So if you have any questions, um, feel free. I'll, I'll try to get to a few of them now, but otherwise, um, or I can hang around and chat if you would like to. Uh, but otherwise, thanks so much for joining us, and we will see you again hopefully next week. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Oh, will I list the books and authors that I referenced? Absolutely. Uh, Frank, I will, I'll, 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 why don't I put those, I'll post those in Facebook. So uh, you can visit the Facebook page. Um, Michael, thanks so much. Come on back next week. Um, let's see here. Um, what is the deepest mud of Passchendaele that impacts the shape of our, theolo of our, of our theology? Is it the heresy of modernism? Um, thanks, Frank. So, um, well, I don't think you can get much deeper. So modernism in its full sense, modernism was a movement from 1893 to 1914. And modernism was basically an attempt to, uh, by such figures as Alfred Loisy and George Terrell, to import the rubrics of modern thought almost unfiltered. Jesu uh, George Terrell was an Irish Jesuit, but it was basically a French movement. There was, uh, there was figures like Lucien Labertonniere and uh, Edward Loire. And um, so there was kind of two prongs to modernism. <clears throat> One, it was, it, was, it was adopting a full historicist mindset that, 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 that John Paul mentioned, we mentioned earlier, where um, the Bible was, was historicized. So this was really a modernism, Catholic modernism kind of came in vogue really as the first Jesus quest for the, the first quest for the historical Jesus was just petering out. If you know uh, uh, 19th century history, 
right? And so this is when the liberal Protestants were historicizing the Bible and they were questioning authorship and they were questioning data. And so by the time they were finished after a century of it, there was nothing left to the Bible. And then, you know, you get some, a figure like Adolf von Harnack in around 1900, who says, okay, well, let's just admit we can't write a biography of, of we can't even write a biography of Jesus because we actually don't know anything. But um, we, we can still take something from the gospels, right? We can take, uh, you know, we can know that there's a soul, that God is father, and that we're called to, to basically good deeds. Well, that's it. And then that was even kind of, you know, uh, three years later, uh, Albert Schweitzer kind of put an end to the whole thing. And he said, well, basically, look, the, uh, the, the Protestants, the only thing we know about Jesus now is that he was, you know, kind of a, a European bourgeois liberal, right? Meaning, look, we're all just reading our own presuppositions into Jesus and we can't know anything anyway. So, you know, there's really no point in the Jesus quest. So this was the era, right? So um, basically they were trying, and, and th that was coupled with Kantian subjectivity, this Ka Kantian subjectivity. Remember, you have these kind of, well, we can't know anything objectively in the world. So these kind of traditional proofs for the existence of God or uh, a true, uh, these proofs for uh, this notion of natural law, none of this stuff can be known. You know, so we kind of arrange things according to these categories or this grid in our mind. So we basically have all of this chaotic sense data. It's coming down like like rain. Good analogy for today. It's coming like rain. And you're never we just kind of make sense of it in our mind. But that doesn't say that it corresponds to things as they really are. We organize them according to space and time and substance and causality, et cetera. Right. And so you have. So what does that do then to religious to. Uh, to to religion and theology well it makes it either moral according to kant or it makes it experiential according to schleiermacher well we can just feel this dependence on god right somehow there's it just makes it experiential or moral but it can't be intellectual right and so it was really an attempt to import all of this so you know there was really uh this is why Pius the 10th said it's the synthesis of all her the, the synthesis of all heresies etc so, I mean, uh, there, there's various, you, you can, there's various casts of modernism, various emphasis, various articulations, but yeah, I mean, you can't really, you know, once you've kind of adopted those two norms of Kantian subjectivity and, uh, and, um, and historicism, I mean, you know, there's really, there's no way out, right? And of course, this, this all of this has a tremendous in, impact on, uh, on the state of things, we see that the I mean, they're, they're, I think the, the latest Pew Pew poll shows you know uh, eighty three percent of Catholic kids by the time they're twenty three, I no longer identify as Catholic, right? Why? Because they're in a tradition in which these notions of historicism and subjectivity are championed, and yet in, within the church they're getting either you know something that's watered down an avoidance of the the, fa the of the faith and reason dilemma or the conversation or just simply a fideism retreating. So, yeah, uh, so good question, Frank. Um, it's the deepest mud, I like you. Thanks for drawing out that analogy. Um, okay, Tommy, thank you. Okay, this is exactly what I experienced as an, un okay. Uh, thanks for keeping the tradition alive. You're very welcome, Tommy. Okay. Uh, oh, the, the, you, the, the references on YouTube as well. Absolutely, be happy to do that, okay. Be happy to do that. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, everyone. And uh, hopefully I will see Dr. Hayes, if you're still there. Thank you very much for the, for the warm introduction. And I will see you all next week. God bless.